the neurophysiology and metabolism of alcohol varies by geography. But the last chapter on the way alcohol works on different groups of people has not been written yet. There are these terrible problems in Indian country, but among them are substance abuse, and the other is suicide, and mental health problems like depression. Dr. Walter Hillebrandt is an enrolled member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation of Oklahoma. He's the co-founder of NAC, Native American Capital, where he coordinates and networks among federal economic development programs that target Indian country and tribal communities. Walter works with tribes, tribal organizations, and consortia on projects in such areas as business and economic development, development of natural resources, housing, welfare reform, health, and education. My mother used to say, uh, you, uh, you got a PhD in psychology because you wanted to figure your mother out. And there's some truth to that, which we generally laugh at, but some truth. So alcohol can be a pernicious family problem. I think the other thing I wanted to mention is culture, which is kind of family or family life is governed a lot by culture. And through my mother's side of the family, I'm enrolled in the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. It's one of the 20 some odd tribes, federally recognized tribes in Oklahoma. And uh, as my it's my education progressed. I became more and more involved with problems in Indian country. And uh, most people in the United States, I don't think, have a clue about American Indians and tribes. My family had moved around so that I was born in Corsicana, Texas. I lived for a brief period in uh, Wattis, Utah. It was a mining, coal mining town uh, where my dad worked in the mines. Uh, then we moved to Colorado Springs and then to various places in California, which in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s were a long way from Shawnee, Oklahoma, where my tribe is. But as I, uh, I guess, we, and so one of the things I wanted to say was an apology to uncovering family members' addiction problems. Uh, another thing is uh, I want to express my gratitude to the many institutions uh, involved in my education, one of which was when I was in graduate school, uh, majoring in psychology, uh, my tribe's lands, the, the Potawatomi, are very interesting because they originated in Canada. Uh, the anthropological records uh, suggest uh, there were three tribes, the Odawa, the Potawatomi, and, uh, the, and another tribe. Uh, and they moved from Newfoundland to Central America, central parts of the United States. And uh, the Potawatomi have more treaties with the United States than any other tribe. And there's about 22 different bands of Potawatomi. So there's a Pokagon Potawatomi uh, in Wisconsin, and there's a Forest County uh, Potawatomi in uh, Minnesota. So we're spread out. And what a lot of people don't know is that um, Indian tribes are mentioned in the uh, Constitution of the United States. And it's Article One, the very beginning things, which I think includes, uh, nowadays they're talking about, uh, what's the term of art, uh, the president, uh, impeachment, uh, Article One. But Section Eight, of, of Article One of the Constitution of the United States says relationships between Indian tribes and the United States of America are the sole province of the Congress of the United States. 
states, territories, whatever you are, you don't have any say over Indian affairs. It's the exclusive province of the federal government. And just in 1789, in 17, uh, around 1790, around that time, they passed the Non-Intercourse Act, which says by statute the same thing that Article 1, Section 8 says, which is states, municipalities, territories, you don't have any say over Indian affairs. It's the sole exclusive province of the federal government. I think another factor that a lot of people don't know is there's a hierarchy of Judas of judicial prudence and priority. The, uh, the bottom rock is the Constitution. The second thing is treaties signed by the President and approved by the Senate. They take precedence over everything except for the Constitution. And then come statutes that are acted. So if there is an inconsistency between a treaty and a statute, the treaty reigns. Well, this substance abuse and suicide are terrible problems in Indian country, but everything's interrelated to one degree or another. And so there's housing problems, health problems, but, but here's another thing that most Americans don't realize is American Indians whose tribes are recognized by the federal government. There's sometimes there's tribes that aren't recognized by the federal government, they are recognized by states. There's like four tribes in Virginia, Northern Virginia, that just recently got uh, acknowledgement as being federally recognized tribes. Well, there are these terrible problems in Indian country, but among them are substance abuse and the other is suicide and mental health problems like depression. And that health service is free. It's under the aegis of the Indian Health Service, which is part of the public health service, which are all part of Department of Health and Human Services, DHHS. So American Indians have health care facilities which were originally provided by the federal government and it goes back to treaties and in these treaties which the Potawatomi or Kings we've got these 22 treaties which are an exhibit at the American Indian Museum that for a, last year were hi highlighted and are available in our own museum in Shawnee, Oklahoma. But um, why do, should American Indians get free health care. And that really got a lot of impetus under the, the world's a paradoxical thing, but Richard Nixon brought back government to government relationships between tribal governments and the United States. And the, in those days, in the, the days of the Nixon administration and before, child maternal and child health in the United States on reservations was equivalent to what it is in third world countries. There's terrible infant mortality and, uh, and maternal and infant mortality, not surviving. And uh, so there are similar problems faced by other minority groups but they don't get free health care from the United States. So why do tribal members get free health care? And the answer is the treaty, the typical treaty between the United States and an Indian tribe, such as the citizen Potawatomi, is there were hostilities. People were killing each other, and so they called a truce. That was one of the things. The second thing is um, the land that the tribe occupied was defined by, by the treaty and it had an area, so it might be in South Dakota. But a good example is the Navajo Nation. The Navajo Nation, which has 200,000 Navajo people, many of whom speak nothing but Navajo or, or little English, but primary language is the Diné language. Uh, 
the uh, the, tr the land was set aside and reserved for the tribe. But what happened is if gold got discovered or oil got discovered or something of real value got discovered in the reservation, the United States would re revisit the treaty and shrink. But the Navajo reservation is in three states. It's in New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, and there's a little bit maybe even in Colorado. And it's roughly the size of the state of West Virginia. And so there's around 260 federally recognized tribes and the Potawatomi are just one. And we get free health care, but you have to live on or near the reservation to get the free health care. Well, when Nixon brought back government to government relationships, one of the things they did was whatever you looked at, if you looked at education, well, kids going to schools that were run by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, it's the BIA, Bureau of Indian Affairs, is part of the Department of Interior, and they used to be pretty much, they were sort of like the entire government in Indian country. So they ran hospitals, they ran schools, boarding schools, and I think more and more people are, whenever you start talking about it, it we get back to trauma because I work with um, with people from all over the country, either as participants in studies or in data collection and analysis of studies. And uh, Indian kids' success, academic success, uh, is the lowest among any groups in the country. Health care, again, we had maternal and child health, but there's other problems, including addiction, which are worse in Indian country than on almost any state. And uh, the BIA was doing such a terrible job in health, they moved it to the Public Health Service and DHHS. And then they started giving tribes the option that you can run your own health care system and the money that, that we used to supply for those services, you will, they'll be your employees, they'll be your hospital, your nurses and everything. <coughs> One of the first tribes to do that, to take advantage of it, was Citizen Potawatomi. We have our own hospital, we have our dentist, stuff like that. And in general, my tribe, like most tribes, are taking over the benefits of the treaties. So they have their own educational system, their schools, and of course in, in a school that's run by the Choctaw, well they have Choctaw language classes. By the way, the Choctaw, there's all these things people don't know, but there's the, uh, they made a movie about it, the Code Talkers, mm -hmm. which were mainly working in the Pacific Islands. And the code doctors were not restricted to the Navajo Nation. It was They were the biggest volunteers for it. But the Mississippi Choctaw, which uh, the majority of the people there speak their language as well as English. And they were code talkers too. So there's three or four tribes do that. And they're credited with a lot of the success in the Pacific. In the Pacific. So the neurophysiology and metabolism of alcohol varies by geography, but it's the last chapter on the way alcohol works on different groups of people has not been written yet. What's more strikingly clear is the relationship between trauma and uh, substance abuse and depression and suicide. So um, it's not automatic. The tribes took over, are still taking over more and more, the educational system. And this really got underway in the 1900s. And there were a lot of religious orders that came to help the tribes. Uh, in their education. There was a number of boarding schools in Washington area. The Washington, 
I'm reluctant to say their name, the professional football team from in Washington, D.C., uh, used to work out at Carlisle, Pennsylvania in the beginning of the season. And if you go to Carlisle, Pennsylvania, that was a boarding school for Indian kids, and there's a little graveyard there for, for all the kids that died uh, in, in the schools, and, and now there's been formal apologies by various Christian groups, uh, church groups, uh, for the maltreatment of Indians in the boarding schools. There was a lot of sexual and, f f and physical abuse. The mantra was, kill the Indian, save the child. They had potentially good motives, but um, I think there's, in the news, the Catholic uh, Church schools and seminaries uh, where there's a lot of of child abuse and and uh, and adult abuse, sexual and physical abuse, it was an involuntary thing. The BIA came, they took your children, they took them to a boarding school, and they would the children could come back to visit home once or twice a year, and they were traumatized by leaving because they were not allowed to speak their native language. They'd be punished if they spoke their language, whether it be Navajo or or Potawatomi or whatever. They were all dressed in uniforms and they were not allowed to uh, practice their religion. That's traumatic. Even more traumatic though is back in the beginning when decades before Plymouth Rock, the native people didn't have the antibodies for measles, chicken pox. It has been said and not refuted that uh, when the reservations were established, the blankets of the people suffering from smallpox were taken and brought out to the reservations and given to Indian people as a form of genocide. When Squanto, the native person who allegedly helped the pilgrims learn to grow corn which was unknown in Europe, and uh, harvest and, and to hunt. He went to England. A lot of people don't know this. Squanto actually went to England on a ship. He came back to the United States, and when he came back, there was no trace left of his village. Everybody died or moved away. The, the die-off of exposure to European diseases, unintentionally in many cases, resulted in mass extinctions of villages and even tribes. In the, the 1900s, the citizen Potawatomi were, were a poor tribe. We didn't have many resources. We don't even have a reservation. There's 20 some odd tribes in Oklahoma that don't have reservations. There's only one, and it's the tribe that sits on top of a, of a lot of oil and uh, they, have, they have a reservation there. So it got so local vendors in Shawnee, Oklahoma, where the tribe is located, wouldn't take checks from the Potawatomi because we, our expenditures exceeded our revenues. Well, we got, uh, when I was a graduate student at Riverside, I was contacted by my aunt who said, fill out these forms because some's going to go into the pot allocated to health and education and housing and welfare and the rest is going to be distributed among tribal members and i got five hundred dollars which was very a lot of money in 1965. when the potawatomi told the bureau of Indian affairs that we were going to do it this way distribute the money this way said no you're not because you guys don't understand enough about economics and you don't have the resources. And in those days we elected a guy who's still tribal chairman from the 60s, Rocky Barrett, John Barrett, said the money had been held in trust. Here's another arcane thing about Indians. The reservations are held in trust by the United States of America. So the Indians living on the reservation now don't own it, in a sense. It's owned by the United States as the trustee. Well, guess what the trustee was doing with, our <coughs> with the, 
the money that was going to be held by the tribe for housing and other, uh, and other needs that we had. <clears throat> they said, you don't understand enough about it. And Rocky said to them, well, we know this much. We know enough to put the money in the bank or a savings account and get interest on it. And the United States had sat on that money for 50 years and non-interest bearing accounts. And Rocky is a tough guy. And he said, everybody in the United States is going to know what you've been doing to us and the rest of the tribes. And so we got the money now. We, went, we owned the hospital, we got the schools, we've got a uh, uh, wonderful housing program, uh, and, and that is repeated over and over. But tribes are confronted with the historic trauma from the, A, the die-off of contact of, of Europeans, later the reservations, taking the children away and trying to turn them into Anglos, is all changing, but the trauma is passed from one generation to the next. I think I was um, introduced to C4, which in those days was called the Cobb, this is three decades ago, by Norm Hoffman. My company, Support Services International, had, has had for three decades grants and contracts to help tribes develop and attack the major problems that they prioritize. So now they make an annual plan and their goals and objectives and they get grants. Tribes can get federal grants and contracts and then in turn hire consultants like me. That's how I reluctantly got into substance abuse because uh, we got actually a contract to provide technical support to all the tribes east of the Mississippi River. A lot of people don't realize there's five tribes in New York, there's two in Florida, there's some in North Carolina, so they're all up and down uh, the east. And so we would help in curriculum development and sections of that would involve substance abuse. And and in those days, in the this we started this work in 19... 1979 and uh, so that's how was the first entry and real focusing on bringing Western research strategies and training strategies to work synergy that way. What I liked about uh, Cobb which grew into C4 is we've had one continuous mantra which is treatment outcomes uh, and Surprisingly enough, even to this day, there's lots of addiction treatment centers that don't do follow-up. There's a lot of it's because there's impediments. It's really hard if you're going to track a person. How did they enter into treatment? What factors entered, influenced their entry in it? What experiences they did? And when they come out, are they sober? And are they not just sober for one month or three months? Or they you got to follow them up for a year to see? So that's one of the things that, that I, I think another thing I, I'm not sure, <laughs> I'm not so good at politics. I served on the C4 board for at least a decade and uh, I recently said I needed to resign uh, uh, from the board because I've got some health problems that keep me from being as effective as I might be. Uh, I I didn't I don't think I've got an official letter yet <laughs> that that gives me an excuse uh, and and one of the, so one of the mantras of C4 is treatment outcomes assessed measured followed up find out what works what doesn't work what doesn't work try something new until we get it right uh, the second thing is there's outreach to indigenous Native Americans. There's not that many. Uh, over time, there's been more and more, but there are uh, uh, a lot of universities now that have Native uh, programs, and so the students coming out of those programs can do the same kind of a con consultation uh, 
on outcomes measurement and training methods and stuff like that. So that's one pool is academia. Univers Washington University in Washington State has a program. Several, several universities in, uh, in Oklahoma have programs. Colorado has it. And so that's a wonderful thing. There's two tribes in uh, Florida. The Miccosukee, and what's the other tribe in? Uh, it'll come to me in a minute. Anyway, the Seminole. So the Seminole have lands, several r virtual r r reservations in the state of Florida. It's not all just in one county. And uh, they were getting uh, old people like me, they're taking buses to go to a uh, bingo operation that they had. And us old timers like bingo for some reason. And uh, there started to be busloads of people coming to the, to the bingo parlor. And the sheriff of the county, people complain, say, what are all these people coming down our county roads to play bingo? And I mean, this is a state, right, that has legalized dog racing, horse racing, high lie, and others, I think, now. But this is back, all this happened back in 1980, I think, around that, that period. So the sheriff came to the tribe and said, what are you doing? And they say, we have a bingo parlor. And they said, so I'm getting complaints of big buses coming down and slowing up traffic. And uh, the tribe said, too bad. And they said, too bad? He says, I'm marching your asses into federal court. And he went into federal court and they said, they're using county roads. They're doing game, gaming. They don't have any agree agreement with the tribe, with the, United, the county or the state for, for bingo. You know what the judge said? Article 1, Section 8. You have nothing to say about the, the county, the, the use of the county roads by a federally recognized Indian tribe. And not only will you cease and desist your efforts at impeding it, you will personally guarantee the safe and efficient movement of people. Well, these Seminole are smart people. In the last decade, they spent a billion dollars and they bought the franchise to the Hard Rock Cafe. And now they just made a huge improvement on their own gaming, I think, and, and that includes Hard Rock Cafe too. And culturally speaking, games, sort of like dice, are part of the culture of a whole bunch of tribes. So it's not like gaming is some weird thing that they got from the white people. They had games involved. Uh, one of the games they had was lacrosse. I used to work with a guy that worked at IHS from La Crosse, and he told me that, which is a native game in, in, in the New York tribes, he said the games generally, traditionally, would go on for two or three days, and if the women of the tribe, who are quite powerful in, in the governance of, of some of those tribes in, the, in New York, if they uh, felt like the, male, the men weren't carrying their load, in the lacrosse games, they would get some physical retribution by the women of the tribe. <laughs> but other tribes started seeing what the Seminole were doing and said, good idea. And so initially, uh, there was a resistance because it goes back to the Constitution, Article 1, Section 5. There's often uh, com competition between states, counties, and federally recognized tribes. So, um, so many tribes were doing it. Congress passed a law. Congress rules in, in Indian jurisprudence and said the Indian Gaming Act, and it said the state and or county has to do a good faith effort working with the tribe so that they will agree to have gaming. Like, there's three classes of gaming and the one that involves 
the, the one that was mostly was just like slot machines. So machines got approved first, and then full casinos with roulette wheels and all of those poker and stuff like that. I'm too cheap to ga gamble, so we've done a lot of consultation, but we, we haven't done any help in gambling. There is a secret to the success of Indian gaming, and it's the same thing as in real estate. It's location, location, location. There's a number of small tribes in Southern California, and uh, they have full-blown casinos there, and they have a compact with the state of California, which from time to time gets renewed. The tribes became really militant. I remember in Southern California, uh, the state was maintaining that the tribes were in violation of the agreement they had with the state and the tribes got a whole bunch of semi trucks and they encircled the the casino and uh, told the state that they would have to come in in an armed fashion <laughs> if they were going to try to shut down their gaming operations so some of these places and, and some of those southern california tribes are big bucks The tribe tried to negotiate with the state of Wyoming to have gaming. And there's no gaming, no legalized gaming in the state. And the state said, forget it. And they said, it's our reservation. All of the federal judges said, you guys haven't bargained reasonably. So what we're doing is we're going to say they met the burden by the Indian Gaming Act. And now you, the state, are going to have nothing to say about it. <laughs> because you lost everything every time. So that the Northern Arapaho tribe is the only tribe in the United States that has a regulatory commission that's run by them rather than a reg regulatory commission that's shared between the state and the tribe. So our victories are so few, it's good to be celebrated whenever you get it. I am a psychologist, licensed in the District of Columbia, I'm also the head of a company that does uh, research and training in Indian country. And one of the things that I just believe that, uh, and I share with all my clients, things are getting better, but it's been omitted for a long time in uh, psychotherapy and addiction treatment and prevention efforts is the idea of gratefulness to a creator. There's two kinds of people in the world, those who believe in dichotomies and those who don't. Well, I'm one who doesn't believe in them. It's because everything has risks and rewards, you know? And life has got all these struggles and none of us are gonna get out of here alive. Eat dessert first. If you're not thankful for all of the wonderful things, I've had a lot of trauma in my family and I'm thankful for the fact that most or almost all of them recovered from uh, the traumas that they had had and changed their life around. But anyway, I just wanted to reinforce a sense of gratitude. A second thing about substance abuse in Indian country is most people in Indian country are not drunks or drug users. In fact, one of the exceptions is, this is a terrible thing, is it, it's a lot better now, but two decades ago, if you needed uh, a medication prescribed by a physician, I'm not even talking about, it could be a reflux drug or something like that, uh, it's really hard to get around most reservations. You take the Navajo, it's the size of West Virginia. And uh, so it, it's not unusual for people to have to drive for an hour to get a medication. And so then when they have it, and let, let's say they got a reflux condition, they take them, this happens a lot in Indian country, the patient will take the medication, they will get better, their cousin will need it, or something like that, and not able, not having a reliable car or something like that. So then they'll share the drug, which generally is especially bad for uh, drugs that are antibiotics because the, when you stop, some of them are left, and the bad ones then tend to be develop an immunity to it. So that's a, it's not just mood changing drugs that, but most people, most Indians living on reservations do not abuse drugs. But 
those that do are somewhere between two and five times greater in percentage than they are out in this, this neighborhood. It's a terrible problem. But we got to keep in mind, it's, it's not everybody. It's not, oh, there, you know, there's a stereotype of a drunken Indian. And there are drunken Indians outside every city, sometimes because they've been banished explicitly or implicitly from the reservations because they're driving drunk, stuff like that. So it's a terrible problem. The literature from the last 20 years on the effectiveness of psychotherapy, including addiction treatment. The primary vari variable that makes a difference in the success is the respectful interest expressed by the treatment provider that establishes a positive relationship rather than an accusatory one. And it turns out that no particular training is better than any other. Psychotherapy provided by physicians is not any better than that provided by psychologists, which is not any better than that provided by social workers, which is no better than a good AA group that's really functioning well. That's changing. And C4 is part of that movement to change it, to find out what works and why it works, and then to spread it. I'm particularly attracted to motivational interviewing, which is one method of trying to get, you know, you're trying to get somebody to change something, and the drive to want the drug is so great that it's willing to cost marriages. And, and you know, they've made movies about it, you know, just alcoholics or other substance abusers that can't stop. And now pharma, the same pharmacists and pharmaceutical houses that are being bankrupted now also, though, produce some drugs that help on craving. So I think that this, this we're getting past this paralysis in the last two decades and finding out what works. David Mee Lee, he's such a proponent of, of minimization of damage and stuff like that. And I think that's part two is that uh, things like providing methadone to uh, people who are addicted uh, is a great idea. And the idea of trying to get them built in systems that are, that are effective and efficient. I'm not taking any new patients. In fact, I don't even like the word patients. I call them clients. People, I want to work together with people to change factors that are screwing up their life. And uh, my health condition is such that I can't work. I used to work probably, it would vary, but I'd provide working with individuals uh, between zero and 50%. And uh, I'm not taking any new clients because I just don't have the time and energy to do it. But that's what's driving me. I was really touched that uh, C4 suggested that you all interview me. Well, anything without you would be incomplete. <laughs> and uh, I just want to leave the world a better place. Sometimes as an absolute stranger can give you life-changing experiences. I confess to being a critic of treatment outcomes, a fairly vociferous critic, saying that we don't know what's working and what's not, and uh, we know that the training's not seeming to help very much. I thought that the adjunct therapies, things like dance therapy, art therapy, music therapy uh, are benign, but I didn't think that they would be particularly effective. Well, now I uh, go to uh, a dance therapy that's based on uh, yoga. I go to another dance therapy that's really humbling. These people can just move their hands, you know, gracefully, and I'm, and the, they're moving their feet to different rhythms and stuff like that, and I'm struggling with it, and I'm 
and I'm in a singer's group now, which really is hard for me because my wife comes from North Carolina where everybody in her family plays two to four instruments. They make their own entertainment, you know. When Before we were married, I, I think it was my first visit down there, the mom was playing the organ, the one brother's playing the the banjo, somebody else is playing the violin, stuff like that. I got two harmonicas with me, and they say, come on and play with me, play us with us. And I said, well, all I got is a C and an E flat harmonica. And before my very eyes, five people, no capos, don't miss a note, and switch to playing an E flat. And that's when I said, I'm out of my, my league here. Catch this, nail this woman down. And our daughter has toured China, Australia, Europe. Uh, her first instrument is piano. She's got a master's in uh, piano performance. Uh, she uh, sings as her second, cello is third. Sometimes she was in a big chorus and she'd come down out of the, out of the stands of the performers and sit down and either play four-handed with the pianist or play the cello. But she got tired of all that stuff and she wants to make a difference too. So you know those movies uh, about Apollo movies? They're kind of coming back and uh, they, they got the big room and everybody's got two TV monitors and they're all huddling and doing stuff. That's my daughter. She works for NASA now. She just got an award for uh, writing the code that takes care of the space station when nobody's on board. But I'm not proud. Anyway, the, one of the reasons I'm talking about it now is it's systems. Everything is a system. You know, there's elements and relations, and we got to work together. So I'm, I'm loving singing, and I, I may be my wife who has perfect pitch, well, <clears throat> hit the note for me. But it's changing my life. I'm so thankful. And I f feel so stupid that it took me three decades to learn how important and how wonderful these adjunct therapies are. So I'm big on family therapy, too.